Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Lone Star RIA podcast, the ultimate destination for real estate investors seeking expert insight and strategies. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out, this is where the real estate magic happens. I'm your host, Ray Sasser, and today we're joined by very special guest, Mansoor Chaudhry with Transact Title. Mansoor has been in the title business for 16 years and the real estate business for 32 years. He is also well-versed in 1031 exchanges. Mansoor, welcome to the podcast, and thank you for joining us today. Let's start out, if you don't mind, tell us just how you got started in the real estate and the title industry. You know, uh, James Ray, I'll, I'll be honest with you, like anybody else, I would say uh, most of your students and your attendees come to the events, right? Everybody gets started in this industry by accident or through somebody else, right? <laughs> uh, so I was fortunate, uh, uh, actually, probably technically over, I was like, James asked me how long I've been in real estate, actually. 32 years, but actually it's been longer. So I grew up in the business at the age of 11, right? So my dad- you grew up, Wait, you started when you were 11? Right. Not directly. I had no money at that point, but a candy bar and a bicycle and good hope. Right? All right. Uh, at that so at that juncture, my dad was uh, got involved in the business from probably nine or 10 as a side passive income, like most uh, real estate investors. At that point in life, nobody really had any sort of uh, education, groups, mentorship right, that you right. could uh, go and participate in. I mean, in the late, early 80s, there was nothing. The only thing you knew was good deal is to go to the HUD auctions or the, uh, or the distract oh. auctions or the RTC, uh, Resolution Trust Company. I know I'm dating myself. So I used to go with my dad and attend those. And that's where you got a lot of properties. And, oh, you know, through the progression of time, you realize there might be other avenues. And then he started getting into tax sales and other avenues. So I remember most of my summers were spent. He'd get me a bologna sandwich, drop me off in the morning at age 15 at the tax assessor's office. I see who was delinquent. And then I go, and back those, I, you would probably remember that, uh, Ray, more than anybody else. There was microfiche out there. There was no such thing. As That's you. right. Microfiche for title cards. searches. I used to go and pull up cards. Some well, let me, let me stop you. I want to stop you just for one second. So my wife said when I would take my kids with me to go look at houses and stuff, my son called her one day and said, uh, Mom, Dad won't feed us. And, and, of course, I would feed them. I would go to the 7-Elevens where they had the $1 hamburgers and the uh, big gulps. And he, he ratted me out and said that. And she called me back and she said, oh, it's a crime not to feed your children, right? So it sounds like you were brought up just like my son was in that world. So anyway, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. My younger son is not as forgiven. He's done that. I've taken him out of some, right? But they don't really care. My younger son would like to, but he's... Big about you know you know, what are we gonna eat you know, that that's the next thing I'm like you gotta earn your keep boy you gotta <laughs> so I get that my dad would give me a sandwich I'd make my own sandwich and show up right and at five thirty he would pick me up and then that would be that I'd say, this is the deal that we're gonna you know did you know I you know it's kind of this you don't know what the right hand is doing but the, what the left right. hand is doing I right. just do one thing and certainly over time it got the progression where I could have the right hand put the left hand together and see where I was at it would logically start to make sense right, right. now. I look at it now with the progression that's taking place with the groups and the mentorships, the groups such as your Alamo. I mean, you don't have to reinvent the wheel anymore. You already no. you have proper guidance, right? I tell everybody, I've already taken the hard knock, so you don't have to experiment because I've already right. done it for you. Right. If you choose to go that route. With you guys, you already done the homework. You already know. It's tried and tested, right? So that, that that's a good thing with groups like yours that makes me very appreciative. And I tell people that microfiche and that, they can't even imagine that, right? I was like, what? That's how you did it. Yeah, there's no internet, right? I mean, and just forget that. There was no cell phones back then. Now, did you, now, I remember going downtown and looking through the microfish. Is that what you're referring to, where we would bring up those? Yeah, I got you. And the cars. There's some rural counties you go through the uh, the cars. And then yeah. from there, uh, I would figure out who's delinquent. And look, I didn't know what I was even looking at. You had to pay per page to print something like five or ten. That's some nominal quarter. Uh, right, right. Actually, the quarter it went up. And I would go then to the clerk of court and then go print off the sheets for the microfiche, right? The tax would have the cards. The other ones have it. You know, every state's different. But some states, believe it or not, uh, they've automated. But uh, some of it's still archaic, right, uh, where you don't have access to data. In Texas, we're very blessed that you can get a lot of online data. If you go to Georgia and whatnot, a lot of times you have to, sometimes in some of those states, you've got to go uh, old school and go pull it, right? Yeah. So I know I dated myself there, uh, but, you know, it was honestly the best education I ever had. Well, now you said you started when you're 11, you're doing it for 32 years, so that means you're only 43 years old. 
No, I'm way older than that, but I didn't want to count that time because I was a rookie at that time. I can't even count that time. It was my time of doing knocks. But what I counted is only from the time I was 23, 22 or 23. Okay. Uh, basically at that point. So I'm 54 oh. now, 54 now. So yeah, that's about, you know, I, if I can't, it wouldn't make sense. <laughs> and I don't count that education. I didn't know. I was just uh, not, I didn't know half of what I knew. At, at the age of 16, I started to figure out, okay, there's something to this, right? Method to the madness. Right. And that's when the, uh, uh, I didn't know what a sub two was. There was no term back then. I, yeah, I kind of created my own sub two, but not knowing it was a sub two. And I only realized that like 20 years ago. Oh, God, that's really a sub two, what I did yeah. on USDA. Well, you bring up a, a good point because there weren't, when you started then, that means there weren't hard money lenders. There no, weren't private right. lenders. There wasn't wholesalers. Um, it's like we've got all the, you know, like house hacking. What the heck is that? And I didn't realize the first the house I ever did was house hacking. So there's so all these, it's almost like, um, it's like now we have our our own vocabulary. And just like with sub twos, we didn't call yeah. them sub twos. So, no. so, so that's, so you kind of started out with like being around your dad and he was doing, he was looking for tax, uh, I guess, buying properties at the tax sale and you're doing titles. Uh, taking it out, pay off the mortgage and then sell it, flip it or do a lot of holds. He was doing a lot of rent buying holds back then. Later, he realized like everybody else is good to diversify. And I got that from him, which I think was good advice. Uh, you got to keep some, you got to sell some, right? You know, mm-hmm. so you got to balance it out. You can't do one, too much of one. Right. It's all right. about diversification. Okay. Right. And that applies whether you're investing in the stock market or any other factors out there. Now, was that mostly residential that y'all you got started in, or did he do commercial yeah, also? Absolutely. hundred percent residential. Later, uh, you know, life started doing more commercial, right? So, you know, I'm I'm well versed with both, but my my uh I got my stripes on residential, right? So so how did you make the jump from a title uh, from an investor to a title company? What inspired you or what drove you well, to you know, it's like everybody else, you have a day job. I had several other entities. I had an IT company. We had like a, probably over 160 employees. Uh, I was a flint. And natural progression is like at that point, like any other investor, I need to start building. So then I went to school uh, on the side at night for two years. And I uh, learned how to build. I had a lot of basics, right? But I believe if you're going to do something, in your craft, you should go, nobody should do better than you. Go learn it from the inside out, right? And that's essentially what I did. I uh, went there, I learned it, I mastered it. Then I started doing a lot of new construction uh, and I was doing land development uh, because of the fact, it, you know, uh, it, uh, to me at that point, it's like, oh, it's not enough margin, but actually there was enough margin, right? And it's less risk to do a flip than to do a brand new construction. Well, you, know, uh, you know, I had somewhere with all of that when my other businesses were doing well, Lending was very easy at that point. I'd walk into a bank and walk out, right? 100% finance. And at that point, it was very easy. You know, came in the 90s, just get money everywhere, right? Uh, so I started doing it uh, and I started building a lot. I did very well in that. 2008 happened and that's when the uh, crash started, right? Uh, at that point, I started getting out of that market and started going back into flips. But during that time, I had a passion to start a title company because I used to buy those the land. Uh, uh, that nobody would buy or had uh, issues on, uh, basically. Whether, you know, today, I mean, the, uh, the sexy glorified term is title defects, right? But title defects is a broad, broad subject. It could be the easement, pipeline, HOA issues, uh, and whatnot. You didn't know what you possibly had, um, what you're going to. So a lot of times I was like, man, th- this is a good niche. If you find some properties that you can actually pick up that have issues that nobody wants, that to me was the best juice because the issue was at that point, it was very hard to find properties to build, right? Uh, and it still is to some extent, right? So at that point, I started buying those issues. And later, there, there's a huge barrier to entry, right, to get into the title industry. So I've been buying for about 10, 12 years previous to me getting in the industry, but nobody wanted to give you, you know, a short, they want somebody with a more pedigree in the title industry. It's a very conservative industry, right? Not uh, well, much experience. I, I, it was one of those things I was fortunate enough to meet my uh, associate at that time around 2007, 2008. And I mentioned, hey, I've, I've tried for years. He's like, well, I used to try for almost a week, trying to make contact, and I give up. Uh, or oh, stop, wow. right? And that year, that June, I started contacting other underwriters, other title companies, and they're like, oh, well, you know, you look like you know what you're really doing. Let me pass you along to this guy in Dallas. I contacted everybody else, nobody. He happened to call me up. He goes, uh, 
hey, Johnny, you call me Johnny. I hear you're a special. Let's talk. Uh, and I started talking. He goes, okay, I feel comfortable. Why don't you fly to Dallas? I flew out the next morning. And then he said, well, back me and felt comfortable. And that's when uh, Slim and I got started. And, you know, uh, that was, from there, we've kind of, you know, a lot of trial and error and uh, get going. But, you know, we're able to figure out everything, what we needed to, and become successful with good clients, essentially is what we have from Alamo and, and, and yourself, for that matter. And from there, it was easier because I, I understood title of the fact. Uh, and I like it. I still enjoy figuring out solutions that nobody can figure out that are out of the box, but it has to be compliant, right? So the underwriters know when we call, they got out of the box solutions that nobody's figured out, but it's compliant and they, they're they comfortable with it because at the end, it means nothing if you can't sell the property, right? I tell everybody that. Let's talk about that for a second, because that's really um, good to know that you came up that way because you're dealing, I think a lot of people don't realize how screwed up title is everywhere. And so when you started getting involved in transactions, you started finding that out. And it's like the title, just like you said, the title's not, this deal's no, not valuable to me if the title's not marketable. So now you've right. got to learn the different ways to make the title marketable. And I think we could probably do a Zoom call just on that alone. So that, that might be you can't, you know, And the thing was, my niche was going to build it. All the builders were going to figure out how I was getting those lines. Well, I get one of the title defects, then, but I had a feeling or I had the right people where with all that, but I didn't know what I know now, to be honest with you. you know, I had a decent knowledge base, Noodle, but you know, there's a lot you learn over time, right? I'm a big fan of time. You learn a lot in time and a little bit of hard knocks. So uh, I was patient in that I would just put on a contract and work through it with the title company and other people to help me walk it through. So my land cost was always significantly cheaper than other builders. Right. So that allowed me even during the downturn to be way cheaper by about 15, 20% cheaper than the next guy to where I could withstand and get out of the market during the downturn, right? I tell everybody, you don't make your money when you sell. You make your money when you buy. Exactly. And that's the rule of thumb that I've always gone by. So I've seen like some of our members of our RIA and just other people I've known over the years, they have this expectation that the title company is going to fix the title and they don't realize how engaged they need to be involved in that process. So share with us some things about that. You know, sometimes you have, you know, a lot of times that, you know, Ray, you bring up a very good question, right? A lot of times you've got a lot of parties to the transaction. You know, I tell people the best news you're going to get is the dirtiest title too, right? But you got to be patient, right? It's an investment you got to make, right? And that's something you got to figure out if it makes sense or not. But a lot of times you have a lot of parties. Let's say you've got Grand Mima passed away and there's eight children, eight children had 16 children out of that half have passed away, right? So from here on the chain, it flows down, right? And regardless of whether or not they've taken possession of the title, they are intrinsically in, have certain entitlements that they have rights, whether or not they even know it. But you have to flush through that. And now if the gentleman passed away that has rights, then his wife is alive and their kids, then it's going to transfer to them. So you have to flow through there. Like uh, one kid may pass away. Okay, who are his kids if he has any, right? right. So you have to factor through that, right? And you can close that out. There's, everything has, uh, you know, I tell everybody, 98% of the transactions we can close as long as everybody's patient and going to do their part. Some of the things that people can do when you're a wholesaler or you're an investor, right? Uh, communication is very important, right? Uh, for example, the, one of the, you, sometimes we had one, we had 64 sellers just recently on a transaction, right? Imagine you know, 64 uh, sellers and we had eight of those were trusts, right? Separate, eight separate trusts. So it's been in the family for generations, hundreds of years, basically, for what I really understood, right? So sometimes we couldn't get in touch. With, well, I, I know Mima's, uh thing. I talked to them one time. Great. Can you send us the information? We don't have it because sometimes we get one or two contact details and an email address. There's only so much to try to come and do because we don't have the rest of the information. Now, we're a little bit fortunate. We have other databases that we have subscribed to of recent that we have access to certain information that others may not have access to in other relatives. That has exponentially helped us a great amount to be able to identify who the ears are and get a, a faster response. But it means nothing, right? When you're talking to the people, you have a very intimate connection, right? When you talk to the sellers and the distressed sellers, you get certain information out, right? But I one thing I tell everybody, be on up front with the, whatever the issue is with the title company so they know how to fix it because nobody wants an issue later. Nobody wants a lawsuit later, right? right. If right. It's, you, there's a way to get it done clean where everybody's happy, get the check at the close of the table and leaves without having a phone call later or a certified mail letter in a few years, right? Yeah. That's what I tell everybody. That's the game is to get it settled, get it quick, clean, 
sell your books and move on to the next transaction, right? But communication is important. A lot of times asking good questions of the sellers, right, that you're dealing with. For example, oh, uh, how'd you get the property? When did you attain title to the property? Do you have title to the property? How many people were there? How many children were there? How many siblings? Did they have other children, right? And a lot of times they don't even know, right? They forget. It's just, oh, well, I don't keep in touch with Aunt Susie. She's our own side of the family, right? We just cut off ties with her, right? Okay, great. But there was Sally. Did Sally have any kids, children, right? And yeah. believe it or not, I know it's superfluous to ask somebody that. They're like, well, the title comes through. Yes. And what we do is when we get that information, we have our own databases. We do a tree, right? It's like a family tree. You know, what you see with uh, anthropology.com and all these websites. Here's the, the heir, the master, right? And from here, it flows down to so-and-so died this way. Or there was an ex-husband. There was a second husband. He had children. We'll then go figure out from there where it flows down. But I can tell you right now, if we have that information at the front end, your closing is going to be increased by 60% speed time. Because otherwise, we're going to do the digging. We're going to get to it. We are. Other title companies these days, I'd be happy to say it to you, uh, uh, Ray, but a lot of title companies don't want to do a dirty title because it, it bogs them down. It's not cost effective. And if they do, they'll outsource it to a third party or offshore center and say you work in escrow offices do it. Our title company is a little bit different with Slim and I. We actually train all of our staff that work the title defense directly. So when you call the escrow officer, like you deal with Patrick Kishwa, she knows what file because she's personally working the file or right. her assistant is working. Right. You got real time. Not that let me just put a note in the system and see where they're at. And they'll say, well I left a voice on. it ends right there. No. With us it's a little bit different. We have a voice on we follow up and send an email. Now we are if we get somebody our relatives Hey, who else is it? Then what's the best way to contact them, right? Because you somebody has to take ownership of this, right? Yes. To get it done. So that's the reason why it's a partnership between the investor, wholesaler, and the title company. You know, nobody's perfect. But you know, yeah, I tell everybody, we have the gun. We just need the bullet. You give us the bullet, we'll fire. But give us the bullet. Look, right. It's a new point for anybody. And you bring up a good point. A lot of people, they don't realize how complicated that title is. I, I, even in my own case, I sat down with a guy one time. He, on the phone, he says he's the only owner. And when I get over there and start talking to him, he's got like 100 heirs. And it's like he well, thinks that's always the the case. That, that, that happens a lot of times. It's like, <laughs> oh, I forgot about it. Do they really count? And, you know, a lot of times, do they really have to get a check? Yes, they have to get a check. Even though whatever yeah. it is, it's, it's got to be shared if you want clear title. Okay. You know, a lot of times, so some heirs are not at fourth, right? So a lot of times it comes down to asking really good questions of yeah. the people, especially when they're willing to sign the contract at that point, you have a very captive audience. You can get a lot of information out. Because later, I'll be honest with you, sometimes, you know, uh, the uh, memory fade, let's say, when the check is coming closer, people forget a lot of things. Right. And right. you don't want to have a problem later, right? So, if there's a, because at the point, once you get your check, they're gone. The town company may be dealing with it, right? I get it. But, you know, a lot of times these guys will sue everybody and their mother along with it, right? Uh, if right, right. So it's a bad matter of just everybody getting the information on the front end so we can work through it. Because there's a way to get it closed. Always a way. But you just got to have questions to get it out of your cell. Well, for example, let's say an heir is gone. They can't be found. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Well, sometimes you can get uh, notices out there to get it out, but a lot of times there's other family members too, right, uh, right. to do that. Uh, some, some, there are some rules on abandonment and whatnot that you can go to. But nine times out of ten, if you tell somebody, I mean, I mean, we can almost find most people, I'll be honest right. with you. Right. Uh, especially when you tell them you got a check from the title company, call us back. You'll be surprised for $500 what somebody will do to call you back. Right. right. It's free money. I tell them that's easier money than going to the lotto at that point. All you got to do is sign. Right. And you can get a clear title. I mean, it's very rare that we can't find anybody. I'll be honest with you. We, right. With the databases that we have access to. Uh, and they're similar to what you know you see from law enforcement. Right. So we have access to things that we can get that others cannot get. So um, if we're uh, if we're looking for some. Well, share with me, like how. I know if I'm dealing with the right title company in, in this context where some places you turn in an order, that it's just like they forget about the order, uh, there's title issues. What would you expect? So, so here's one of the things audience. you got to keep in mind, right? So we're an independent title company. Texas is the most regulated uh, state for the title industry anywhere in America. And not only that, Texas is the most... Uh, uh, 
scrutinized for any license, whether you're dealing with a physician, a law firm, engineering firm, mediation, whatnot, they believe in open uh, access. Everybody has a right to playing field, but they're very regulated. If everybody can come here, but you better play by the books, right, and rules. So we have a lot of independent title companies. Uh, the larger title companies, and at, you know, at this uh, juncture, I'll figure you guys know who they are. We're not their large, small, mid-sized firm, right? So I would, if you're dealing with one of the, let's say, I'm, I'll, I'll throw out an example of, let's say, store title, right? So a lot that we deal with store title, they only own one underwriter, right? That's that. So they can only underwrite according to those right, uh, criteria that they can. If they can't close it, they say, no, you're done. You can't close it. Right. So what happens is it's important to have a title company that has a number of underwriters. So we basically have probably two many, but we have First America and both First Americans. We have Fidelity, we have Chicago, we have Alamo, we have the full Fidelity family. Uh, we have WFT, which is reinsured with Lloyd's of London. We have West Coast, reinsured with Lloyd's of London. Uh, and uh, uh, we also have uh, a host of other companies, Doma, North American Title, whatnot. They're all regulated. They're all these, uh, you know, highly rated companies, but some transactions fit for certain underwriters. Others may not fit. Commercial may go to one. Our rap may go to another underwriter who understands that we have relationship with, right? right? So when you deal with one that only has one company, guess what? I know certain underwriters I will leave unsaid at this moment, right? They will not touch a wrap or a sub to or do anything with the title defense, right? We have certain transactions over the years that we have done that are already been approved. Right, because we've done so many, they know we have. Also, we have very high underwriting limits, right? So we can do a lot that we can underwrite ourselves. Plus, we have the title fund. So we have a little additional benefit that others don't have, because most title companies uh, don't maintain their own title funds any longer. It is not cost effective. They go with the shared pool access. We like to have control, so we have our own title staff. They have anywhere from 32 to 40 years of experience. And uh, we get the better feedback, better data that we can present to the underwriters. Here's why I'm making the case. Here's why it should be approved, right? And if that underwriter does it, I got, I got like 10 or 15 other guys I can go to, right, uh, that I, we, we could talk to as well to get it approved. So having just one underwriter, it's like going to Bank of America. When you go to the bank, they're giving you one bank. They don't have uh, any other under, uh, underwriter, right, it's that mortgage lender, which is theirs which is going to initially place a loan, but they're going to immediately sell it to every broker out there as well, right? So why is it not better to go to the broker? We have more outlets. What we give you is more choices and outlets to get your closes successfully closed or consummated, right? Otherwise, right. because the other guys, they don't have many outlets, and that's just their underwriting that you're done. Right. So one of the things I always say is suggest that we go to an independent title company because they have many more outlets and ways in their to uh, tools in their toolbox to get your transaction closed. And that's a long-winded answer, but I'm no, it's about good, it. That's I mean, we've learned that with property insurance. You know, if you go to a broker, different properties, different locations, different types of properties, yeah. it makes a difference. And so what you're saying is when that file comes in, y'all have got to make a decision what the best, knowing what the- what Underwriter what, place of it. So we don't place it with one underwriter. So when we have 10 transactions, and we know that one is going to go to Fidelity, that one will go to First Run, that one will go to Doma, that one based on the type of transaction it has. And let why don't we it's just step to, listen? Uh, now you work in this, you work in that world every day. So a lot of things you're going to take for granted that a lot of us, uh, even if we're experienced, we don't really understand. So let's say I've got an earnest money contract signed. What I'd like to do is just kind of go through the whole process, not in super detail, but just kind of like. I fax it to you, or I, I guess fax is the wrong word now. I'm dating myself. No, we, I'm still fax. I like faxes too. To be honest with you, I love it. We don't get, well, I'm noticing year after year, we get less and less faxes. Even one of the escrow right. going off says, We have a fax number. I said, Because you never know when someone's going to send you a fax. That's right. And to be honest with you, sometimes that is a very effective uh, form of communication considering all the cyber fraud and whatnot that's taking place. So we send you a contract, a signed contract. Now what happens? Uh, let's just tell, go all through the thank all you. steps. Yeah. Of course, we tell you thank you, right? <laughs> the most okay. important thing. Uh, what happens is our uh, uh, escrow coordinator will then input the transaction and collect the earnest funds, right? And we will post that and send out a receipted contract, right, to all the parties that are involved, right? And that's one of our jobs to do. Shit. We will receive the contract and receive the earnest money. There's two parts to every contract, earnest money and that. Earnest money is very important because that's consideration, right? And right. when you track contracts, 
have a certain specific language in it that you, you can deposit within three days, right? Otherwise, it can lapse, right? But once we post it, we send out an acknowledgement. The request will then go to the title plan, right? The title plan will go back and check uh, the history and the property. They will go back as needed. Uh, many transfers, right? You may bought it today. We may go back to go back to the 50s. We may go to the 40s. On some transactions, we go back to sovereignty, right? To check wow. the history to find out. If grandma had the property, she sold it, so did that happen? Some happened without title insurance. We scrutinize those a lot more, right? And Let's oh, stop right there for a second, because you're using a term that a lot of people don't even know exists, and you're calling a title plant. Maybe explain a little bit about what a title plant is and how you all use it. Okay. That's a very good question. Okay, yeah, I take it for granted. So the title plant is uh, a repository of information that we have from our own closing and other access points, and we lease data from other uh, providers of data, right? So we have our own title plan. So we basically have a majority, probably 93% of the data in the state, to go back to sovereignty, we have access to. That's the same as Stuart or anybody else, right? But we don't have to outsource that. We use our own people to filter, research, and put it together. These gentlemen are, are ladies as well, right? Um, will have amassed what we call starters. So they've researched a lot of properties. Think about it. If you're a title examiner for 30 years, Oh, yeah. Can you imagine how many you've done? So they usually keep a record of that. So they know what we left off, the way they need to pick up, so they have to reinvent the wheel. Our data is a lot uh, easier to filter through. We have started utilizing uh, artificial intelligence as well. That's not the uh, fail safe, right? But we use it as a tool. We still have bodies that go back and review it. We'll go back and check. We have the history of all the properties and all the transfers we sent to the title plan. And then you have to have the proper staff that know how to interpret that data to see if it was done correctly or not, or here are the pendant issues that are, remain on the property. Mechanics. That's the title examiner. Uh, okay. There is a uh, anti-terrorism, there's an IRS lead, there's a divorce thing, there's a list of pendants, which so means that in Latin term, it's uh, a notice to all parties legally, right, uh, that you cannot close this. That's what our examiners individually put their eyes on and go scrutinize everything from the automated tools to physically, and we have a double set of eyes that go through the plant that we have a procedure in it that one, two, multiple sets will then review it to see if it's accurate and whatnot as a fail safe mechanism. After that is done, the title claim will go to the title officer or the escrow officer. Can I just assistant. stop you for one second? Sure, so a lot of times people will just go and pull up the grantor grantee index. And when you right. say a title plan, just contrast one method over the other, how they compare to each other. Okay, uh, uh, when you go do that, it'll tell you grant or grantee, right? John Doe had it, Jane Doe bought it, right? But does it really tell you that John, when he's, uh, he's transferred property to Jane, he got one over on her? Does it tell you, Jane, that, hey, there was a, a contractor, a paying contractor who hadn't, wasn't paid 42000 had a claim on the property, could later come back within two years to foreclose on that property, right? It will not tell you that. That's where the title plan will go in. They will not look at this transaction. They look at this and go back as necessary to sovereignty if need be to cumulatively look at the entire record and see, hey, this is what's there. This is what's outstanding needs to be addressed for the closer. What we call Schedule C, those are conditions to close. That tells us if we were able to check this off, check this off, pay off Bank of America, yeah, pay off McKenzie, pay off ISD, Pasadena ISD, which they're very aggressive. They always won't get their money to Pasadena ISD. I tell everybody that. <laughs> HOA is just another stand on. HOAs have too much power, but that's another subject. That's my soapbox. I tell everybody, don't get me started on HOAs. Whatever it is, everybody's been checked. As long as you check this off, you can close and we can ensure this transaction. Should there be any issues, somebody comes up and says you owe some, we stand behind it, right, till the test of time, right? right and right. Uh, what people don't realize, title insurance is very inexpensive. It's not even 1%, right? And that buys you peace of mind insurance because you're protecting the American dream when you're doing that, right? And you, uh, broke, and up you, don't have bit, you broke up a little I bit. What, there. When you get title insurance, it's a one-time cost. People don't realize it's not car insurance. We right. got to pay every month to State Farm for years. And I'm not picking on State Farm. And it's less than 1% guys, right? normally. Yes, yeah, way less than 1%. Right. But you right. find peace of mind and you don't pay a one-time expense. You tell me if you can pay car insurance, would you not pay if you pay one time and you're done until you sell right. the car? I would, that's no question asked. The issue is title companies are regulated, right? So the same rate we have, everybody in the state of Texas has, but it's an equal playing field, right? Because we're there as fiduciaries to, uh, to serve the public. 
Right. You know, that's what people don't realize. It's not like car shopping. Well, you go to everybody, it's the same rate. It depends on the service. I tell everybody, uh, I don't sing, I don't dance, I'm not good looking, and I'm short, right? <laughs> uh, what, the only thing I got is I got service, and I'll I'll answer your phone call, right? Uh, to me, that that means I mean I got a little bit of noodle I've learned along the way, right? That you may be valuable to some, and some it may not be, right? But it comes down to over time relationship with the title company. It's very important, right? right. Because title companies are a you know, I tell everybody, the investor, the host, they're a coach, right? But you have to have good team players. You worry about the deal. They need to worry about closing, figure out a way to do it. The inspector is if it's a good deal. you got to find the finance. And everybody's got to have a place in the in, in, in the team's hierarchy, right? There's no such term as I. It's a team. And treat all your vendors with respect. I tell everybody that, right? If you want them to return your call and keep working with you long, uh, long term, right? Never abuse your vendors. Okay, so so we're at the title plant. You got an underwriter that's watching it. This is the title plan process is much more elaborate than a simple grant or grantee index. The chances of catching something are going to be a whole lot higher. Absolutely. Now, if somebody didn't want to get a title policy, do they still have options of getting like uh, um, their title checked? Yes. So we can do a title search, right? So within the title insurance thing, it's all money inclusive, right? So it's a really good deal, right? Uh, if they don't, they don't have to get title. We can rec- uh, run various reports, a uh, title opinion report, a encumbrance and opinion report that is much more comprehensive. It's similar to what a title commitment is, but not as comprehensive, right? And obviously, the the cost is very nominal for what you would get, but we can do that. We have third-party tools that we can also do that are maybe $150 that we can generate a third-party reward. But keep in mind, right, and all, I want to be very confident to all the uh, viewers out there that that is not in short right it's right, just right. And a report you get it if you want to insurance and a commitment right that's when the uh, the title insurance comes into play so let's go back now once somebody is moving forward the title plan sends the commitment the, the closer knows this is what we need to, she needs to do or he right to close this uh and sometimes you have to go back to the underwriter hey i don't understand can you clarify and remove this right. commission we have in-house underwriting can take care of a lot of that and sometimes you have to go to the underwriter, right? And uh, they say, okay, do this, we'll do this. Schedule B basically says these are exceptions of what we will not insure on, right? For example, if there's easement already out there, I can't change that. Nobody can change that. It is on record, right? We'll accept that like any other title company in America, right? That's because it's not insurable because it's already out there. We don't control that. So they will then go reach out. Let's say there's a buyer seller. We'll get their in, uh, biographical information, right? We will then, let's say if there's 42 people, we will run 42 individual searches on those people. We have a lot of other databases to check on every sale. For example, anti-terrorism league, OFAC, right? Uh, there's a lot of other uh, rules out there for our financial institutions that you have to check for compliance to make sure there's no money laundering, things of that nature, right? And that's yeah. constantly intensified. Once we check that, we say, it's good, we got the biographical information there. Oh, uh, Sally, you've got a lead. Okay, this is what's got to be paid off at close. Okay, no problem. So we budget for that. Once we figure out who it is, we will then order the payoffs from the lenders. If there's a buyer's a bank, we will initiate con- a conversation with them. Here's your CD. Here's what you anticipate to bring in. Here are your costs. We will distribute the settlement statements or CDs, what they call closing disclosures, right, to all the relevant parties. So each party knows what is the worst case scenario, what they're expecting. It's usually a fairly accurate estimate because it's issued by the title company, right? At a right. certain point, the un- the bank will give us, hey, these are my charges. So once we do that, let's say Jane Doe has a buyer, the bank, she's going to fund her, right? The buyers don't trust each other, don't trust each other, realtors don't trust each other, you know, and everything. So that's why they go to the title company, the neutral party. We will then handle the funds for all parties. We will pull the taxes and say, you know what, John, you have 18000 in taxes that are past due. That has to be paid off or insured. Okay. So when the buyer's funds come in, right? from the bank, right? We will disperse after all debts are paid off, what balance will go to the seller, rightfully speaking, and the buyer will have a clean title insurance policy and all the things, issues that are there, liens, judgments, encumbrances will all be addressed at the time that they close. If their one item is not cl- uh, is still pending on what we call a Schedule C, condition of close, it will not close until that's rectified. Well, and I want to I want to spend. You've mentioned this several times, and I I didn't want to interrupt you, but so the underwriter sees that everything he's he's determined what's going on with title. 
then he's generating, and this is what I want to talk about, and maybe go through the three important schedules. He's generating a title commitment. And once he generates that title commitment, we're going to get a Schedule A, a Schedule B, and a Schedule C. So could you kind of step us through each one? Because as if I'm the one buying it or selling it, I want to see that title commitment. So tell me what I'm going to be looking for. Sure. So the Schedule A will tell you the parties to the contract, right? For, you made a good point about the seller. Sometimes one seller says it may be somebody else, right? So the Schedule A will tell you the name of the insured would be the buyer, right? Uh, uh, it will also tell you who the seller is going to be. It will also tell you the loan amount. It will also tell you who the lender is going to be, if you know who the lender is going to be. It will also have your legal discussion, so you know what you intended to buy is what you're going to get, right? And we better so check all that, not, right? We better. Right. And to be honest with you, I tell everybody, a lot of times we'll follow the contract. If we see something different, right, you may have, and it happens to you, and I know it has. It happens to everybody. You may enter into a guy and meet with him. It's John Doe, right? But John Doe don't own it. Great grandpa owned it, right? He's got it. Later, Tyler will come back and say, hey, Mr. Uh, Sasser, uh, this is great, but the, our commitment will show, hey, party John Doe shows on contract, but grand, great grandpa shows as a recorded owner. We need to get that address or do a deed from this to John Doe, from grandpa to John Doe, or we need to figure out the airship rights if he's passed away. We'll already address that in Schedule C. So that'll tell us, every, that's our checklist, homework. That allows you to know, hey, for the title company, their homework to clear this is on Schedule C. That's the most important part of the commitment, in my opinion. Yeah, but let's, let's just go through these. So A is telling us what the deal is, who the parties are, what the property is. So we want to buy that. To the bank. Yeah. So now let's go to Schedule B. What are we looking for on Schedule B? Schedule B will give us exceptions to what we will not insure, right? For example, if there's easements on the property, Centerpoint has a line running through the property. Right. You'll say these are the issues that are on the property. When I say issues, not necessarily issues. If you have an overhead uh, power line, it's not going to really affect you, right? But it may affect you if you can depend on if you're going to put a high rise. I don't know. I'm just giving you an example. Most of what doesn't happen. There's an easement. There's a water creek over there. It's over there. Let's say the city of Houston says you must maintain that water creek or water pathway, right? That will be all identified in there, right? Right. For most people, and I say this with a grain of salt, for most people, the Schedule B, they don't read it. There's not usually much to affect. I mean, almost every house in Houston has some sort of easement where center point can come through your property, right? That's right, right now. Because imagine if you've got power and it's cut off at a line, and across the street, they can't get it, but they got to cut through the yard. They're not going to wait, right? So they can pretty much do that. Those issues are usually listed in there when the title says, hey, you already had this previous to us. We can't do anything because that's what's there, right? So, but we're bringing it to your notice, but we're not insure on this. Then the Schedule C will tell you, hey, you, these are the issues that we will insure and stand behind it through the test of time, as long as these I checklist items are able to uh, uh, be addressed on your title to flex, allowing us to complete the homework items. And then based upon that, once it's closed, we will then insure. That's so all just- I promise to you. And I'm trying to just make sure we kind of cover, check all the boxes. So in Schedule C, that's where you're going to show like a an encumbrance, like a mortgage encumbrance or something on the yes. property. But you're going to insure that because part of what you're going to do at closing is to pay that off. Absolutely. Okay. It's, it's a chicken and egg. It's time, a lot of this is always simultaneously done. Right. Does that make right. sense? Yes. So we may get the funds or not have it clear, but we know it's in trust. It's going to happen. The lenders know it's going to be happening because that's why you have to decide them. They know it happens simultaneously or parallel track. Right? They're so, very cognizant of that. And so, like, if I'm a buyer, I want to look at that Schedule B and say, okay, this is not going to be covered by my title, right, and my title insurance. These are that's things that right. are going to still be stuck out there. Okay, so, right. for example, right. mineral rights that are not going to be conveyed would be on Schedule B. Very good analysis there. Your mineral rights will always be there. Water rights will always be everything that we're not going to insure. And no title company is going to insure mineral rights because it's already there, right? It's, it's right. Subject. So right. That's subject. Right. That's already previous. It's absolutely correct. Okay. So then, then Schedule C is basically any of those things that are going to be fixed as a result as, as it goes through the closing process. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Okay, and then what are some of the things, a problem that we run into all the time is dealing with taxes. What are some of the things you see with taxes that happen? Okay, so for example, his, well, you're asking a really good question. That tells you you've been doing it a long time. 
<laughs> so a lot of times you will find uh, where it has something you got to be careful of. If there's elderly people over 65, there's disability, right? When you're going to transfer the property, I tell everybody before Harris County was a little bit more lax and everybody, everybody needs tax revenue, all tax and jurisdictions. So the minute you change, let's say over 65, veteran, uh, disabled, their taxes are nominal. The next guy's going to step into it, right? There was what we call a rollback. Uh, a lot, your taxes will be much higher, right? So the title companies will then base it on the new values. Before the title companies are somewhat lax, we don't know what's gonna happen. Now, the new value, what it, you'll be taxed there, not on the old tax value, right? So that's something you need to keep in mind. If the guy's over 65, been living there for that long, the next time he's gonna sell, budget the tax amount on the new sales price. It will not be at the old sales price. That's something where some, and I've been burned, I bought stuff at auction, right? And later I got an over 65 exemption. I had one house I happened to buy with a group that asked me, hey, call me last night. Hey, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, guess what? Uh, we had a $28,000 tax bill, right? So we each got about $3,000, which I'm not complaining, right? Any money is good money. But uh, that was something they could not have known, right? Uh, and I didn't close it either, right? So <laughs> had I known, I would have mentioned that to them. But, I mean, it was a learning experience for them too, right? But that's something that's very big right now. Almost uh, uh, without error, Harris County is going to send you a tax bill, typically, on the title company. That's why every title company will go ahead and collect on the new dollar amount on the sales price. Okay. And uh, some of the other things, now that gets us to the title commitment. So we've, we've turned in the contract. We've mm -hmm. uh, gone through the title plan. We've had an examiner look at it. Now, the underwriter yeah. is the one that's going to sign off on this deal and say, okay, this meets our criteria, right? So, so the underwriter will sign off on it. Now uh, we're ready for the closing. Okay. Yeah. And so now it's, what are some of the things that are going on with tech, you know, and I'm sure technology gets involved in this, but are all, a lot of closings happen remotely now. And what happens if the person's in another country or another state? And what, what does that oh, look wow. like? Okay. Another good question. So a lot of it with technology, we can do remote closing as well or send somebody out. But with technology, people like to do with automation. They do it online. So we can remotely handle the transaction if they're a U.S. citizen green card holder. And we've got certain biometric information. If you're sending in Timbuktu and, and Nairobi, we can close you if you're a U.S. citizen green card holder because we have certain data sets so we can confirm that that is you. And as it is uh, equal as you being sitting here to do it, right? It's a great tool. Kind of, uh, you have a seller or buyer, you're traveling, right? Nothing beats coming to the office to check, right? But it's an extended tool that we offer our clients that we can close anywhere. We do a lot of international transactions, even if you don't do remote notary services or closings, right? Through the automated platform uh, that you can, we can facilitate it going to the embassy and whatnot. So we're very specialized in doing international closings where you have parties overseas as well. Right. It's a good tool. It's, it's just not a tool in our, uh, in our toolbox. Especially, right? But it can be very effective to get stuff done in short notice, especially when you're sitting there, you're in around the corner and the foreclosure time is coming on, on a board, right? And you've got people dispersed all over the country, especially. Well, let's say your sellers, in, your sellers in your sellers in small podunk town in some other state is can mobile notaries are they acceptable for your title company and your underwriters? So what happens is. They have to be approved notaries on our list, and we have notaries that can go anywhere in America, usually within an hour, two hours notice, right? So we have a, certain vendors that are approved and uh, insured, right? And they've given us certain assurances and insurance, right? That we're comfortable. We have to use our uh, approved notary list, right? But they can be out there immediately. I can have 15 notaries uh, anywhere in the, in the country within an hour, two hours. If you say, hey, I got 15 people, let's close them. I can put it in there, and they're vetted and approved. Well, they'll be out there. And they'll communicate this the time and whatnot. It's very easily done. It's so, actually a dodge sentence. Right? Like so, so they don't mind meeting us at midnight at the Walmart parking lot on the day before the foreclosure. Nope, nope not at all. Not at all. <laughs> not at all. And, um, I, and and I know it's funny, but believe it or not, it's happened. You know, we've had some people go out and flying out to China, and they were met at one or two in the morning, signed the paperwork, yeah. were landed, and they flew, flew back out. So believe it or not. It's been a while since I've seen that, but I mean, last time I saw that was about seven years. Nobody was interested that that would have happened in, in that fashion. 
And, you know, apparently there's notaries now that can do it online. So do y'all get involved in any of that? That's what I was talking about, the notary, remote notary. Yeah, sorry, I, I get used to, I'm used to this industry. That's exactly what I was referring to. All, okay. It's all online. Right? Gotcha. 100%. Wow, that's fantastic. But now what that that brings up another issue is that there's so much fraud. I mean, these fraudsters are really getting good. What are some of the things that that you're seeing in the in the form of fraud? And then what are what are some of the things we uh, need to safeguard ourselves against and make sure that we're not, not being defrauded? And so fraud is an endless subject that's the biggest threat for any bank or any title company, right? The biggest thing is know your buyers, ask good questions, or know your sellers, ask good questions. Any wire instructions, always verify them with the title company. Never send a wire without wire verification. Call the title company, especially when the title company is giving you, for example, we use a lot of different banks. We use, I'm going to use Simmons. We use Simmons Bank a lot. If we sent you instructions for Simmons Bank, and you then get go to Bank of America and to Joe's Auto Parts, right? The wire is going to go the day before closing, right? Or the right app. Then it should be like, hey, wait a minute. Look at the old previous instructions. That's going to Simmons Bank. Why is this going to Wells Fargo and Joe's Auto Parts? Pick up the phone. But always initiate any wire, always call the title company or get a cashier's check and deliver to the title company that day. We don't mind giving you FedEx to send the courier to go pick it up because it's beneficial for us, right? But the wire fraud is the biggest cost. It's over two to three billion dollars a year in losses to the industry, right? For uh, just title companies alone, not including the bank and the financial sector, right? We verify that is key because there is an inordinate amount of fraud that's taking place. They will sit on your computer and you will think it's excellent, like title company. A lot of times it may be transact title, which is ours is T R E N S A C T T I T L E. You may have transact title, but the I may be left off. T I T T L E, right? You don't know anywhere because you're not paying attention. You will move it fast you know, right, in this right. society. We move very fast. That's how they get you. So you're thinking you're the correspondent them. It's not. You usually act not our email. It's usually the consumer's email that they sit and monitor for months, sometimes six months, eight months, or a year. And they mimic everything, your verbiage, your prose, your style. So you don't think anything different, right? And then you're like, okay, I'll send the money. I had a client last week call me. He was asking. I said, let me see the email. I saw it. They were wiring $500,000 out. So thinking it was an oil and gas platform. I happened to catch it. It was the letter was off in the domain name. Oh my and then I told him, did you verify? They verified it. They're like, we never sent that email. But the guy was so, you know, David, you've done such a good job with this oil well. You found it. He was going through all the emails, all the uh, people, compliments that people giving over months, making it feel good. Man, I was like, this is a really nice guy. But the nice guy was sitting in, in Nigeria over there, right? And he was just going to take the money. Well, how it is, it'll come into a clearinghouse, an account that has a bunch of other wires come in. From that account, it'll go out through Bitcoin or just get wired back out to overseas. Once that money's gone, it's very difficult to do. What does this tell you? Call, pick up the phone, call the title company. That's the most important thing I can tell anybody. So let me just slow down a little bit because this is something we're not doing. Um, we're not doing very good. So let's say that I'm going to send a money to you or I'm going to have like our lender send money to you or something. You're going to send out wiring instructions. That potentially could get intercepted if, if there was something on the computer. They're just sitting there waiting. Absolutely. So what, what you're saying is, okay, once you get those wiring instructions, pick up the phone, talk to the your escrow officer or whatever, and say, okay, are these the, the correct? Company or the or they will verify this is our correct wiring instructions. Only then should you do it. Never wire funds without Confirm confirmation from the title company, verbal confirmation. Okay. And how would I do that? Would I send a picture of what you sent me and say, is this right? No, you just call them. I want to verify the wire instructions that I have received from you. The other party on the other side will say, this is my Simmons Bank ABA number, router number, here's the address, and here's the dollar amount, right? Because that is the telltale sign. That's when they intercept and they change it, right? And they'll send an email from the title company. It may not be from the title company. If you look down, it's usually a letter off or a dot. Yeah, you won't even see it. You, you won't even see it. And that's exactly how they do it. And it, that one phone call can save you. I, I can tell, I tell uh, people, uh, you know, I joke when I say this. I tell everybody, you've reduced 
your chances are fraud by 75% at that point. Wow. Question and that's, everything. It's that, especially when there's a change of the bank or the change. If, it, if it's transact title and somebody says it's the uh, International Bank of the Bahamas, right? Or it's going to be uh, Joe's Auto Parts. Man, that's not a title company. A title company can only receive funds in the name of the title company. They will never have XYZ number Joe's Paint House or Joe's Crab Shack. It will never be like that. So normally like outbound is where the fraud is going to happen. If it's inbound, it's not something we worry about because if it doesn't get to our bank, then obviously. Yeah, inbound, you don't have too much of an issue. On the other side, you do typically. Okay, now that's the one kind of fraud. But why not also about fraud with title? You know, that's becoming a big thing. And I hear these stories when you're in this investor community. You hear stories occasionally of things that happen. What are some of the things that we've got to be have our eyes open for on title fraud? Okay, so a lot of times you can, we've seen a lot of uh, seller impersonation, is what I call it. A lot of times if you have empty property, right, or don't have not had people live there like land, abandoned houses, you know, people pass away, you will have people create fake IDs and say that they purported sellers. They will usually, if it's a six hundred thousand dollar property, it will go on the market for three hundred thousand dollars, right? Guess what? There's a lot of people who understand value, right? They're savvy, right? Or just anything. Forget right. being savvy. If you're gonna property for half the price, would you not want to go bid on it and try and get it, right? Oh, absolutely. So what they will do is they will generate IDs. Uh, driver's license and whatnot, and go to the title company, enter the contract. They will go typically contact a realtor, not in person. They'll contact, I want to list my property, I'm out of state. They will list it, get an offer. Everything will be a fast closing. We want it immediately, right? Everybody wants free money. They'll say, oh, we want to close it in four or five days, quick closing. And then the ID will be presented from the purported seller, but that was not the seller ever. It may not even be the same age, right? They will match it up with the ID. So we've implemented a certain systems in their software now that where we can uh, go in and find out if it's a valid ID or not to help mitigate that, right? Uh, otherwise, that is, uh, besides the wire fraud, this seller impersonation fraud is going to be probably larger than the wire fraud at this point. Because I think title companies and financial institutions are all becoming more and more robust and savvy with their knowledge play uh, right. in that sector. We're able to catch things. These guys are fit because this is their only job is to know how to uh, fool people and screw people, right? So they're constantly doing this. So it's always a game of cat and mouse between a financial institution, a title company, or a fraudster, right? But if the property sounds too good to be true, too cheap, guy wants to immediate closing, right? If the guy's name is uh, Hector Esposa and the guy's uh, Chinese, then it ain't, yeah, okay, that's not the red flag there too, right? So we see a lot of those. That's our biggest culprit of what we're coming across in this marketplace today. What could I do to assure that I'm dealing with a legit person? I mean, look, ask me, look uh, at you know, the ID, ID, but a lot of times the title company will vet it. And um, a lot of times they don't have it yet, but they are comp- they're now getting software to go in and uh, check the IDs, right? So we're requiring that. Everybody has to give an ID that we scan it and we can check if it's fraud or not. It tells us this is a fraudulent ID, great. Because I'll tell you what, Nick, I'm not that, I'm, I'm pretty good at it, but I'm nowhere close to a machine or artificial intelligence. Not only that, some of the software we have can check the ID for, and passwords for other countries, if it's valid or not. And they have different parameters than, uh, that we can utilize to basically pull in to see if it's valid or not, not just the right. U.S., right? right? But keep in mind, always be on high alert when you're dealing with, especially when it's abandoned property and nobody's living there. It's yeah. highly suspect for fraud. Right, right. And out-of-state uh, owners. Out-of-state owners. So um, what are some of the laws and things that, that are affecting y'all that are changing? Our recent laws that have changed but that maybe we don't know about. And I, one of the things you brought up was like just the, the earnest money. From what I understand now, you can accept the option money too. Is that correct? Yes. And, and actually, that was good because we were doing out of courtesy for sometimes for clients like collected, but it was problematic because why we're collecting. Now we can include it in one check and apply it accordingly. To un- and, uh, option money is what? Option money is the ability to unwind the transaction with an X amount of days, right? Right. And that way you don't have to issue two checks and trace them, who got it, who doesn't. Now one check, the title company will suffice, and it'll be broken out accordingly to your contract because every title company has to follow the contract, right? Because that's the law of the land, that's the Bible, right? And so we don't deviate from that. And if there needs to be a change, then the title company will say, hey, this needs to be an amendment. For example, a lot of times you may have John Doe as a seller, maybe 60 years, 
at the closing time, we can amend it, and it, there'll be uh, the 62, uh, 61 additional heirs will be included, for example, right. at that time. Right. And so some other things maybe you could share with us if there's some changes like the sub twos, wraparounds, simultaneous closings. Where are we at in that world now? Okay, well, a lot is, you know, a lot of title companies and whatnot are underwriters that are shying away, but we do have a few underwriters that are left that are still doing it because we've done so many over the years. They feel very comfortable with us. It's more, there hasn't been really necessarily a change, but FAJ, uh, one of the title companies, Fidelity gave out a memo a while back from about in the 90s, right, that said, hey, you should be aware. Why did we circulate it? I don't know. There hasn't been any uproar. There was a memo at one time that said the, in uh, the mid '90s, that the FHA had said, "Hey, if a title company closes this, that we may take them on a do not close list, a bar list." Right? The Fidelity put that memorandum out. Everybody got word of it. Everybody yeah. shied away. All underwriters, most of the sub twos and wraps. We do some. I'm gonna say we don't, but we're doing less than we used to, right? But with certain underwriters, we can't do that, and we have been. But it's not the same volume that was. It has to fall under certain parameters. And a lot of that is just because they feel comfortable that we do a good job of the due diligence. To me, feel comfortable whether or not we can close that or not, or feel that there's no issues on it, or what's the likelihood of somebody coming back to bite you. And what about simultaneous closings? We can do we uh, uh, that that that's a misnomer, right? Simultaneous is going to mean a lot, <laughs> uh, but in the, in the uh, two, post two thousand eight sense, it means that every party is bringing their own fund into the table, right? Independent of the other transaction. Now there are transactional funding sources out there. We approve for several transactional funding companies. As long as we're closing it, we're, we're approved for them in the state of Texas. We do all of their work. We can easily put you in touch. Hey, this guy does transactional funding for a nominal cost. You can do it as long as we're closing it, it can happen, right? There are some other ways to do things, right? But that's something that we can talk about our class about to discuss that maybe, uh, or it's not really worth it, worth it right. class, but maybe some other alternative options that we can discuss one-on-one uh, yes. with a prospective class. Okay. Yeah, and that's, if you come into a situation where you have to do that, just your advice is call and let's see exactly what you're doing and we'll figure out the best way to do it. Yes, okay. absolutely. So the... One of the things I don't think people understand is the power of a relationship with the person they're working with. Um, I think through this phone call, I hesitate to even ask you this because you seem to understate the value that you bring to the investors. And I I do think I do a better job bragging about y'all guys than you do yourselves. But you're the best cheerleader we've seen. But relationships are everything because when I need, when I have a problem, you could be the difference between that deal getting done and not getting done just because you see it every day and you're willing to pick right. up my phone. Right. Well, we have a lot of blue hairs in our organization, right? Uh, <laughs> a long, long time they've seen anything, right? And I've learned a few tricks along the way from them, and they've learned, uh, I think, a couple things from me along the way, right? A relationship is very important, right? Some people are transactional and go different, 10 different title companies. Uh, you know, there's a comfort level when one person has been dealing with somebody, you know, for a few years. They know how they think. They know what they can anticipate. Just Ray likes it done this way. Ray doesn't like it done this way. Hey, this is a fraud thing. In this relationship, you may not be able to close everything, right? But, you know, I mean, typically, I'll be honest with you. I tell everybody, if I can't close it, nobody can close it, right? But that I do that in the effort that somebody understands, right? That you, know, you need to establish relationship with a title company because there's certain variances that they can make or comfort level. You know, everything we do today, and they teach you in bank, and then I've been on the board of other banks and financial institutions, KYC, know your client, right? And it's the same thing applies for us, right? We have a comfort level, and maybe certain things you can do, right? It has to be compliant. But right. you know, having a long term relationship is very important. If you're dealing with 10 different title companies and you're in a bind, you do something immediately, who's going to jump for you? Right. I'm going to jump for the guy that I have a long-term relationship, right? right. Uh, rather than somebody who calls immediately, I need to close tomorrow, I'm going to give you 100 transactions. Uh, that does not move a title company. Tell me, I'm going to give you a bunch of transactions. Anytime I hear that, it's usually a red flag. Talk to me or anyone else. I want a relationship for the long-term, right? That excites me. Uh, you know, I don't need a million transactions every year from you. But, you know, if there's one transaction every six years, I would hope we have a relationship that I, we will get that. Right, right. It's not a volume. Oh, sorry. You said that perfectly. It's people need to know who they're working with. They need to have a level of confidence and trust. And it's easy. You want those people to be your customers on both sides of it. You know, if it's from my side, 
looking to you or if it's your side looking to me. Um, real briefly, I want to wrap up, but before we wrap up, I want to talk a little bit about 1031 deferred exchanges, tax deferred exchanges, and maybe yeah. maybe just do like a 20,000 view summary. It's not something where we're going to try to get them to understand it, but I have, you're not going to believe this, but I have a cousin who just closed on a property. She had a title problem about six months ago, and I told her what to do to kind of fix it. She fixed mm -hmm. it. She sold the property. She said, Ray, I'm real worried, and I think she's getting the check like today. And she said, I'm real worried that I'm going to have to pay taxes. But they said because it was a homestead. That was about 15 years ago it was a homestead, not, not in the last 15 years ago. She said, because it was a homestead, now I'm real worried about paying taxes. And I said, well, like, if you had called me yesterday, I think we could have done some things instead of you $50,000 in taxes. Because now she's all of a sudden realizing of that $300,000, she's going to end up probably paying $50,000 in taxes. So if it's her homestead property and it's- No, it was 15 homestead. years ago. Oh, okay. So now it's not. So she will have capital gains. So what happens in that situation uh, let's say, for example, she bought it for ten dollars. She's selling it for a thousand dollars, right? Uh, that's going to be a, a massive amount of capital gains. What will happen at that point is, uh, it well, sir, let me just let me just tell you, she bought it for twenty. She sold it for three hundred thousand. Oh wow! Okay, that's a lot. So if she hasn't, so there's a way. I mean, you know them. I'm happy to help in that situation. As long as she hasn't got the funds dispersed to her. There may be a way to uh, basically still do the 1031. As long as she doesn't get the funds, once the funds go to her, then she will not be able to do it. That's called constructive receipt, uh, and it's hard to unwind. Well, so what would happen in a situation like that? That's a lot of gain. So all the depreciation she's had for 15 years will get charged back up until a certain amount, right? Plus all the capital gains you have. So that's a sizable amount of money chunk out of that three hundred thousand dollars. You're probably talking at least, you know. Fifty thousand dollars or more, right? Right. What happens is, if you could tell the government, I have an intention to do a likewise like kind of exchange. I'm going to sell this property, uh, which I put a number of four hundred thousand, for example. But I will buy one property or multiple properties equal that four hundred thousand dollars, right? She can use all the net proceeds and get a loan and still, as long as she applies all those funds towards all the properties, one or multiple properties, she will have to pay. Zero in taxes, they will get deferred and rolled to the next property. I call it trading up. And you can do this until the end of time. That's a great mechanism to be able to upgrade, to be able to go and get other properties for a nominal amount and not have to pay the tax. Imagine if you sold 10 properties over 10 years, the amount of capital gains you're going to have to pay. You can actually buy more property with less money doing a 1031 exchange. It's one of the best gifts you'll ever have from the IRS, ever, that exactly. you can get to defer all your taxes. Yeah, and, and I think the advice is um, y'all handle 1031 tax deferred exchanges. And I think if people have questions, because every one of them is different and they're, every one of them is uh, relatively technical, you know, don't get the money before you talk to somebody. And, and literally. Absolutely. And, and a lot of times people are thinking they have to put all of it in there. It's not. So, for example, I'm going to use your cousin as an example, right? If she needs $30,000 to pay out credit card bills or whatever it may be, she can take money at the time of closing. The rest can go into the exchange. So the uh, proportionate amount of tax you would normally have to pay on the thirty thousand, right? She'll still pay that. But the other two hundred seventy thousand of it can go right into the exchange and still utilize it to accomplish that. You only right. pay. You get the majority pro rata benefit out of that, regardless. It's an excellent mechanism to do. Before we had it for boats, art, you know, planes. You know, the company said they got rid of that because it is always intended to the Woodrow Wilson era. Is to be from gear for real estate. So now it's back to real estate, right? And, you know, we used to get a lot off. I got artwork. Man. We can do it. We have done it. <laughs> we just, I know we're real estate folks. That's what we know. That's our playground. That's what we're full comfort. Yes, we can do it. So we're actually somewhat pleased that they got rid of that because honestly, I found that I'm more of a loophole than anything else. The exchanges are great because the government says you're going to take a property of a dollar and sell it for a dollar. You're going to buy it for a dollar. It's equal. So they right. like, you don't have to pay tax. It's deferred. You can keep doing that. So what better mechanism is there of that? And we can uh, you can look us up equicap 1031com e q u i c a p 1031com or call us anytime at 713-429-5466. We're happy to help you. Call Transact Title. They'll connect you uh, to any of the offices, and we're happy to have an exchange office and guide you through the process. And we're going to wrap up, but I did want you to let people know how to get a hold of Transact Title. 
And if there's a website, maybe include that. Do you mind telling us? Sure. Uh, the best way to contact us is at transacttitle.com, T-R-A-N-S-A-C-T-T-I-T-L-E.com. Uh, uh, one of the, we, we have multiple phone numbers on our website for each office, but uh, the, uh, one number you can do that can put you in the office location is to call 713-429-5436. That's 713-429-5436. And at that number, you can also say, I want to talk to somebody about a 1031 exchange or Equicap 1031. We can assist you with that. Not only that, we also have an in-house real estate and transactional law firm uh, that uh, so we'll leave a little bit heads up. And we also offer advisory services for complex transactions, like I want to build an office building. Uh, or I want to build a mall. You know, how do I go about doing it? How do I get financed? We will kind of put that uh, package together and walk you through that. You know, one of the things I learned early on in real estate, it really does matter who you know in this business and who's, who's how to get things done. And when I first met y'all guys, I just knew that y'all knew what you were doing. And I just, all the closings you've helped me with, I've tried to be loyal. If you're out there listening, yeah. you know, they don't make money on every deal, but they make money on the relationship and the relationship's real important to them. So let's, let's make sure we try to support uh, transact title and Monsoor's operation. I just love what y'all guys do for the investor community. So, with that being said, well, I'm not the only one. I've got a lot of women behind me that, uh, that yes. help me do it. I get to shine like Salima or Romero or Amanda and everybody else with that. Without yes. them, I wouldn't be here, to be honest with you. Yes. Yes. None of us stand here by ourselves. So, thank you so much for doing that. Thank you for jumping through all the hoops for me, Monsoor, and uh, to continue to do business with you. Thank you. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. I look forward to seeing you at the next event as well. Okay. See you, Monsoor.